This is Speaking of Water from Circle of Blue. I'm J. Carl Ganter. There are many drivers and they're all in overdrive right now. Human civilization is moving, and with climate change and shifting water supplies, we face the greatest migration in human history. And yes, how do we consider mass resettlement of the world population? What's that mean for nations and communities today? We talk with author Parag Khanna about his new book and his four scenarios for the future. Well, today we're joined by Parag Khanna. He's author of the new book, Move and the Forces Uprooting Us. And he's also author of Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilization. So, hey, Parag, great to see hey, you again. Hey, great awesome. to see you again. First, I think I'm really, really interested in just your, your fascination with maps and with uh, both human and kind of physical geography. Uh, tell me a little bit about, about that interest. You know, it's uh, it's page one, right, of this book. Basically, I go back to my freshman year geopolitics class from college and uh, the professor who really got us thinking about political geography, but the layers of geography and in, in connectography, which you mentioned was sort of like the prequel to this book. That was a book about functional geography, the geography of infrastructure, the built environment um, and, and, and its impact on the world economy and geopolitics. And I kind of wanted to scratch this itch. I wanted to do a book about human geography. And for most people, that's just a, a fancy way of saying migration, but it's not. You know, sort of our distribution, the distribution of the 8 billion people on the planet is deeply embedded and contingent upon other layers of geography, which are natural geography, the functional geography I mentioned, political geography of borders, um, and so on, in, in, in a complex interplay. And we don't make maps that properly represent the intersection and overlapping of these layers. We tend to look at the world, literally look at the world in the sense of look at a map of the world and see either political boundaries superseding everything else, uh, you know, on a road atlas, it's infrastructure that supersedes everything else. And of course, natural maps that in which the environment supersedes everything else. The truth is our reality is a melange of those things. And on almost no maps, in the mainstream, do you actually see people? You don't see pixels that represent the geography of human beings and why we are where we are. So I set out to write this book that answers the question, where will you live in 2050? Um, and to map it out and to explain how we got to where we will be and why and where. Um, and it turned out to be not so straightforward, actually, you know, um, and, and that that's the story of the book and, and how, of course, I it, it sort of compelled me, of course, to push new boundaries with maps. Um, you know, and there's there's a couple of original maps in this book, not as many as connectography, but we actually just keep on making more and more at this point, whether or not they go into a book is secondary. They are definitely all on the maps page of my website. Awesome. Um, so, you know, so you're talking about, well, in your book, kind of you quote National Geographic and that this is the, as they say, the largest tide of rootlessness in human history. So. You know, let's go there. What, what's that mean when we're talking about rootlessness in human history? Well, so in a way, we have been a nomadic species for more than 100,000 years. Nomadism and mobility is intrinsic to the essence of what it is to be human. We may have forgotten that in the last couple of centuries where we became more sedentary. Not everyone was lucky enough to be sedentary. Not everyone is lucky enough to live in a stable place, climatically, politically, economically, socially, and otherwise. But we could generalize and say that, um, you know, people became sedentary. But the drivers of what caused people to move, what causes human geography to shift, there are many drivers, and they're all in overdrive right now. Uh, and those are the ones that I tackle in the book. So, for example, just the, the demographic imbalances in the world, the gap between old and young people, all the old people are in places with low fertility and, um, you know, and, uh, and aging labor forces like northern countries, OECD countries. And all the young people are in developing countries that are, you know, to some degree overpopulated. Then there is, uh, of course, climate change, which is driving people away from ecologically stressed regions towards more habitable regions. 
Um, then there's politics, you know, civil wars, conflicts, and so forth, and expulsions are driving people away from places. And of course, uh, economics, when there are economic crises or technological disruptions, if, uh, if your job is lost due to globalization or automation, uh, you may leave the place where you've lived in order to find somewhere more, more affordable. And now with remote work, uh, you could be advantaged by being a digital nomad who's skilled and in, in demand, and you can live anywhere you want. So technology enables mobility in multiple ways. So all of these are the main forces that drive people to move historically. Um, and by and large, we've been economic migrants, you know, particularly for the last, uh, last several hundred years. But the irony of the moment is, of course, that COVID represented the most, you know, sort of coordinated lockdown in human history. So the question that I, additional question I needed to pose is, how will the future of human geography change and what, what new vectors will emerge and what new patterns and practices will emerge out of the lockdown? So what kind of assumptions are we making about the future that either maybe, you know, what kind of assumptions or predictions are you making? And then what kind of assumptions do you see policymakers and kind of that orbital perspective that we might be getting wrong? What, what kind of future is ahead? It's a great question. I mean, in the short term, I think it's a very significantly mistaken assumption to think that the you know people are literally going to sit still, you know, and this is the new normal. It's not actually true, not at all true. Even during the lockdown, people were moving. People were moving back to places, and that's also moving. Um, what I do is I don't necessarily make predictions. I make scenarios, right? So in the book, there are four scenarios. There is one called regional fortresses in which we do invest in North America and Europe and East Asia and more sustainability, but we ward off migrants. Another scenario is called, the new middle, is called the New Middle Ages, where our sustainability efforts are insufficient. We become, we return to almost a survivalist hunter-gatherer kind of mode. Um, and there's you know, still limited migration and localized, but it's definitely haphazard. Then the, another scenario that is called um, Barbarians at the Gate, so it's like the new Middle Ages, but with uncontrolled mass migrations and water wars, uh, you know, and significant resource stress. And then the fourth scenario is called Northern Lights. And it's where we actually undertake a gradual resettlement of the world population. And we do so in a, in a sustainable way. And that's obviously the scenario that I'm trying to get people to aspire towards and build towards. But note that three of the four scenarios that I posit are not particularly positive. So as I say, we really need to thread the needle. And my goal was, of course, to provide a roadmap to that. Uh, so the big question, you mentioned some of the, some of the pathways. Um, what are some of the really also the big pathways if you had the ear of the White House um, or, uh, or China or other world leaders? Um, what are some of the things that you'd be telling them right now as far as sequencing? Well, for one thing, before we talk about sequencing, let's talk about balancing, right? So you have the COP26 agenda, which is focused on climate mitigation, right? And that's obviously very important to mitigate climate change, to decarbonize industries, uh, to invest massively in alternative and renewable energy, uh, potentially to undertake geoengineering initiatives. That could be carbon sequestration. It could be atmospheric, uh, you know, sulfur injections and that kind of stuff. Um, potentially all of it is necessary. But as you know very well, Carl, the, the climate is a complex system. It doesn't actually return to what it was in the year 1800, 1900, or 2000, right? It, it evolves continuously in new directions, and it's going to be different from what it was. All of the emissions reduction schemes in the world aren't going to suddenly reverse the drought that afflicts uh, you know, so much of the world today. And so in terms of rebalancing the agenda, we need to have an equal effort and, and Manhattan projects, as some people like to say, you know, for adaptation as much as we have for mitigation. And adaptation means how do we adapt our infrastructure? Um, how do we build differently? And yes, how do we consider mass resettlement of the world population? Uh, and that's ultimately the scenario that I'm sort of, you know, playing with in the book is sort of, you know, what does mass resettlement look like? What do mass migrations look like in this century? What are they driven by? Because it's not primarily driven by economic arbitrage, though that's still huge. It's not primarily driven by political unrest, though that's still huge. Suddenly in this century, climate migrants have overtaken other categories of migrants. 
and we don't have a legal strategy for them and we don't have an overarching political or logistical approach to them. And I think that that's part of what adaptation is about, is thinking about large scale resettlement. And of course, you should not expect governments gathered at COP26 to focus on adaptation because that's explicitly not on the agenda. Indeed, it's almost, it runs contrary to the very intrinsic nature of sovereignty itself and sovereign governments getting together to talk about, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, enabling the one thing that sovereignty is still really about, which is pre preventing people from crossing borders. So, you know, I'm a, a hyper realist about the difficulty that we face in arranging large scale migrations. And I don't really talk about it on a global scale other than the aggregate number. I talk about geography, right? Ultimately, with all the maps I make, you know, it does come down to geography. It's, you know, Latin Americans are not suddenly going to be relocated to Russia, right? You know, there are proximities, gravities, familiarities that are really important in these conversations. So, uh, you know, as with all my other books, this one is structured geographically, right? And I go around the world and look at the specific dynamics. Yeah, let's, uh, before we get to Michigan, uh, something I do want to get to, and water, um, what role is, is China and some of the assumptions about, say, their, their Belt and Road Initiative and some of their other uh, kind of growing uh, virtual or real roads on the map. Um, what's that portend for the future of maps as well as connectography? Right. Well, there are a couple of things. One is just China as it relates to the energy system, right? China has, you know, in, in roughly this sequence, invested massively in expanding global hydrocarbon production for its own industrial uses and shifted global hydrocarbon supply chains towards itself. And it's needed to do that since the 1980s and 1990s. Then it's also obviously at the same time then became uh, one of the largest uh, greenhouse gas emitter in the process uh, and began to export its various you know, uh, forms of energy production, particularly coal. So anything that China does today and all of the things that it is doing around solar, becoming a world leader in solar, um, in nuclear and a wide range of other areas, it's still not enough to overturn everything that's still going on, even as they try to slow down on dirty fuels. Um, and I think that's significant. So yes, they have announced that they're going to be phasing out coal fired power plants. They've announced that they will stop exporting coal fired power plants. But let's remember that every single, uh, you know, um, ton of emissions that, 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 you know, continues uh, going back 20 years and into the next 20 years is still doing damage. And it still does require us to adapt. So the Belt and Road comes in in interesting ways, because on the one hand, again, it's a self-serving initiative to build infrastructural ties to other countries to be able to more efficiently extract and you know, uh, acquire resources from them. Uh, on the other hand, it also creates the infrastructures by which people will move and circulate into more climate resilient geographies of Eurasia which is of course where the majority of the world population lives. So in the, in the end, you know, there is also talk in parallel to all of this of a green Belt and Road, right? So not just the Belt and Road of power projects and transportation infrastructure, but even um, uh, high voltage uh, electricity transmission from solar farms and projects like this. So. You know whether they're not whether or not you have a green belt and road and agricultural belt and road and so on what you have is infrastructure across the continent that contains about two-thirds of the human population so as someone who wants to enable a greater circulation of people to climate resilient areas it could well be that belt and road associated projects in russia and central asia are actually going to be very useful for that, even though that has nothing whatsoever to do with the original intent. Wow. Um, so as far as kind of connections to uh, Giulio Boccoletti in his new book called Water, a biography, um, talks about how water has defined civilizations um, really up until this day and our location, even some of our legal systems. Um, so what role is water playing in, in maps and in these migration uh, um, trends that you're seeing? What role is water playing in that? 
huge, you know, of course. I mean, there's places where water is, where there's too much water and places where there's too little, right? And uh, that's the sort of very simplistic, uh, heuristic that I use in the book. But, you know, it's not, it's not uh, irrelevant, obviously, because places where there are floods force people to migrate. And in those same geographies, one needs to think about what kind of infrastructure would be better suited to capture glacier melt or flood water and channel it, uh, you know, deeper into aquifers to replenish water tables, um, on, you know, reservoirs, that kind of thing, because we need to not waste to have this water disappear. So, I mean, in mountainous regions, on the one end, it's wow, you're overwhelmed with fresh water. This is great. No, not so much, because if you don't control it, you wipe out your this season's agriculture and then you're running at low out of seasons because eventually those glaciers are completely melt. So when I looked around at the mountain ranges of the world to try to kind of assess the situation, not surprisingly, between the Andes and the Rockies and the the um, and the Alps and the Himalayas, you know, I mean, the Andes are not infrastructurally or fiscally or strategically there, right? So you already see d deep concern in, in Chile about this, you know, running, literally running out of water eventually. Um, in the Rockies, you've got populations growing in Colorado and elsewhere, but insufficient attention to uh, the likelihood that the glaciers are going to melt very quickly that, you know, this sort of the Rocky Mountain water supply will, 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 will diminish. And even if it does make its way to the Colorado River, it's not going to be enough given the massive growing downstream populations of you know, Nevada and, um, and California. The Alps, obviously, one can have faith in because this is a cluster of very wealthy countries with incredible engineering prowess. So France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Italy, individually and together, probably will find ways to control glacial melt and, and that runoff into productive purposes, agricultural uh, and otherwise. So for their soil fertility and so forth. So I don't worry too much about them because they're the richest countries effectively in the world. Uh, and again, it, what matters is also having the engineering prowess. That's also something that China is known for. But the difference is that what China does or will do with the river systems that it controls have massive downstream implications in multiple directions. Um, so, of course, their their efforts around the south north, you know, water transfer and so on could be good for China's uh, drought stricken, you know, northeastern cities or water parched northeastern cities or cities where they've just exhausted or, or polluted their water supply. But it's terrible for the predictability of river flows for South Asian countries, Pakistan, uh, you know, India, Bangladesh, and into the Southeast Asia with the Mekong River. So where you're seeing just, you know, lack of predictability in, in water flows. So, you know, I, I have a lot, a lot of concerns about those geographies. And then, of course, we should mention the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, and the Nile River, uh, which are, of course, uh, you know, trickling at this point and have to sustain entire uh, civilizations. And what I foresee there, and I write about in the book in chapters, sections on Egypt and on the uh, kind of where the Anatolian, where the Turkic world meets the Persian and Arab worlds is where I foresee a significant swirling of populations because, you know, Iran has recorded temperatures of 140 plus degrees. Um, plus, you've got the conflicts, Iraq and uh, Syria and not directly bordering, but you have Lebanon and Jordan. Um, and, you know, these are basically failed states that are environmentally torched. And meanwhile, in eastern Turkey, you have the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. You have verdant, livable, um, you know, perfectly habitable terrain that's completely empty. And, you know, again, as someone who looks at the history of political geography and cartography and population movements, you can't help but think, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So as I was traveling in, in this region, I've spent a bit of over, I've done multiple trips through eastern Turkey. And it's just remarkable how many fewer Turks you see, because for them, it's a poor and underdeveloped region. So they move westward. But you're starting to see more Iranians and Arabs and so forth. So you can kind of see this process gradually happening. And I, I give similar examples in Central Asia, where you have uh, sufficient water from the Tian Shan Mountains and Kazakhstan and so forth. So, you know, water is crucial, absolutely crucial. I don't think, again, when speaking about the divide between mitigation and, and adaptation, we don't have a strategy at all for what to do for drought stricken places where rivers have dried up and water tables have, have evaporated, right? It's just that we don't, we don't have a plan. 
And I don't think that we're going to have one in the time frame that's necessary, which is why I, I focus so much on migration as the only remaining salvation. Right. So without a plan, are, are you getting uh, any are you getting a response um, from those who are thinking about this as national security issues? I know when we did our, our work in China on water and energy, um, we caught the attention of the Chinese government and the U.S. government because it became a national security threat. Um, is that starting to inch up on the radar? Of course it is. You know, and, and look, uh, I would say it's also the water energy nexus in the sense that there are those countries that are thinking about um, how to do renewable power based water desalination, you know, maybe concentrated solar, nuclear, whatever the case may be in the Gulf countries. That's already a big thing. Saudi Arabia, the UAE. Um, so I think that we're going to see a lot more desalination, but we have to think about the full life cycle, right? And supply chain of that, because you obviously have a lot of waste that's generated that you don't want to be dumping back into the sea. Um, but then, of course, that's still insufficient, right? In a big way. But this, this is localized. I mean, you know, places where there are, um, you know, rising sea levels, you need a new infrastructure strategy. I don't see that in many places. You know, you take the example of Indonesia saying that it's going to move its capital, but actually it's not because it can't afford to. And it picked it didn't really pick a smart secondary location. So, of course, it's creeping up the agenda in a big way. But, you know, as, as I think you and I would share this view that water wars don't create more water. So let's not immediately securitize the issue, which is something that I would say we as Americans tend to do. And I've witnessed happen, you know, in, in, in many contexts, including this one, securitizing the environmental issue is fine, a, a way to raise it up the agenda because that works in a way that fear works. But as we know, that's not going to be the right, that's not the right solution. Getting attention and devising solutions are two, two very different things. So, you know, reading a lot about the role of agriculture industry, the built environment into this, you know, I obviously do believe that we can do a lot more with present and emerging technologies around conservation and efficiency. And in some parts of the world, that is actually going to be enough to maintain stability in water levels if you do it now. But in many places, it's not going to be enough. And, you know, I don't like to be a defeatist or, 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 or you know, um, or to sort of throw in the towel here. But again, I'm focused on human geography. And the fact is you can't survive more than a day, right, without water. And so I'm being very realistic when I say that the most tried and true, uh, the most reliable, the most essential, the most immediate survival strategy for humankind is literally migration. Yeah, just just a, a point of irony, too. On the morning that they announced, it was multiple times, of course, over the years, but that uh, uh, the president in Indonesia announced they were moving the capital. I was literally standing at sunrise on the seawall that holds back the ocean from flooding <laughs> Jakarta, the capital. Somebody texted me and I looked around and said, they know I'm here. Um, that is crazy talk about coincidences but you know I'm reporting in from from Michigan here and a lot of talk of course about climate migration starting to talk about that starting to pot talk about the Great Lakes 20 percent of the world's surface fresh water um, so two things one is you know what's in store in the say the American Midwest for the American Midwest um, and then I want to come uh, before we wrap up to I want to get your recommendations on uh, you talked about sequencing and sequencing infrastructure. Um, what does that mean for a small community all the way up to a, to a nation? But let's start with the Midwest and, and the Great Lakes. Absolutely. Well, you know, this has been a topic in uh, multiple books for me is kind of the future of this geography based on, I mean, when I was writing Connectography, I was kind of looking at the irony again of the depopulated nature of the region, given uh, the fact that it is a climate oasis. So I sort of doubled down on that in this book. And, and here I get more into the sequencing and I say, look, you know, fiscal resources are scarce. And with certain irre irrevocable climate effects already baked in and predictable, we should, if we're going to spend two, three, four trillion dollars on infrastructure over the next 10, 20 years, the way to do it is to first accept the reality of the certain geographies that are no longer going to be livable or habitable, like, you know, parts of coastal Louisiana and other parts of the Gulf Coast, maybe the Carolinas, 
then think about where the habitable locations are, such as the climate haven of the Great Lakes region, and then start to think about what incentives you're going to deploy to move people there so that they can have productive livelihoods and not continue to be in survival mode. Um, and then you plan your infrastructure accordingly, right? And then those states get more exposure, more resources, more investment, because they are the correct places based upon what we know about the future to have more people reside. Now, I think you and I know this, and, and, I, and I'm positively, in a way, uh, surprised that the forces have aligned with the Army Corps of Engineers and HUD and FEMA that are saying, look, we're going to start having very clear guidelines and risk scoring around vulnerable geographies. We're going to assert eminent domain, and you simply cannot use our reconstruction grants to go back to places that are just going to get destroyed again. Um, the next step would be that you know people are more, not just in a free market way, not just in a, in a sort of accidental way, directed towards the, the Gulf, uh, sorry, but, but towards the Great Lakes region and the Northeast, but more actively incentivized to go there. Um, and I think that that maybe is the logical next step. And then there's the key part that you and I, you know, really believe that where the emphasis should lie, which is what I call civilization 3.0, which is that whatever we build needs to have a very light and sustainable footprint, right? We need to enable people to have to be in circular environments, as it were, right? Uh, ensuring minimal, um, you know, sort of overconsumption of resources, you know, uh, using water recycling uh, techniques and feeding that into hydro and aquaponic agriculture, reducing the supply chain, building 3D printed homes, ideally movable homes, you know, flat pack, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, all of these ways, you know, wind and solar power. So make sure that we don't do to the Great Lakes region what we've done to the rest of the world, uh, because this is kind of our last chance, right? Uh, so, so I do focus on the region and focus on how I think it should be done right, uh, technologically, but also this policy and fiscal sequencing. And, you know, there's no more important time for us to be beating this drum, uh, you know, because of course there is so much money on the table and there's so little genuine national strategy, uh, too, which is why I believe that, you know, again, localism, um, and, and which is to say, you know, yourselves, people in Michigan, in the Great Lakes region, you, you do know best. Um, and kind of, you know, hearing those voices, elevating those voices, taking that guidance is going to be extremely important in the coming years. And that's something that I'm, I'm emphasizing uh, alongside you. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and what's the kind of response you're getting? Uh, just a couple last questions um, from, say, when you were speaking to uh, groups, civic group, groups in the Great Lakes, are they seeing this as something that's doable? Are they seeing this, you know, localism is, is great, but then we also have a lot of, um, a lot of kind of structural infighting within our county commissions and, and state governments. Um, are you seeing some up, uptake on this at the local level? I mean, there's no question that communities that I've interviewed and spoken to have been very, you know, uh, they really, uh, or appreciate the validation that, you know, the, for example, if you look at in Vermont, these communities that are trying to do um, agricultural communities and, you know, kind of, I almost call it kind of like uh, kibbutzes in America, right? And they're openly welcoming cr climate migrants from the rest of the country and, and so on. So I, I think that that's, there's very positive trends there. And I think we do need to restructure our local economies around this, uh, you know, local self-sufficiency. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I emphasize that in the book. I've talked to groups that are active in this process that are real leaders that aren't getting, you know, the attention that they that they deserve because this is our future. Parag Khanna, author of the book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. Thanks for joining us as always. Carl, thank you so much. Always enlightening.